gets a goal. Who got the assist? Who got the assist? Hello, so we're recording just off the end of the United game. And wow, can't be that outcome as a non-Bruno captain, but there we are. I'm sure we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, this is the second of our quick-fire pods we're doing in this part of the season, just because it's you know so hectic. And I know blanks, doubles are all the rage right now, uh, but we're going to leave those uh, until our full fat pods next Monday, where we'll be joined by FPL General, as well as having uh, Nick back, because uh, there's no Nick today. He's snowed under with work, needs some headspace. But luckily, Anthony is back from the exam trenches for well, a very, very short period by the sounds of it's joining me for this one you're right, Anthony how are you doing yeah yeah it's good to be back again Tom uh, sorry to miss the last pod but uh, you guys sold it on without me enjoyed listening uh, by myself while in between uh, two exams so it was all good anyway we are going on ahead with this pod and trying to get it recorded so that people have some answers ahead of the next game week so we are who got the assist if you want to get into our mini league it's cpsulf is the code agenda for this pod is very bare bones we're going to do the market forces and then we're going to get onto your questions thanks very much to everyone who got onto tom's thread earlier cool yeah thanks very much everybody um quite a lot of interesting stuff this week i suspect that obviously if i put a question thread out now the question would be slightly different but hopefully we've captured everything in the zeitgeist pretty much as i said a second ago blanks and doubles we know you you want to know all about those and we will go into them in just a few short days but not quite right for a podcast which has about 24 hours sh- shelf life um so first as anthony mentioned it is the market forces and it's, it's quite interesting at the moment isn't anthony there's a bit of a rogue name at the top of the uh, top of the charts yeah of all people i never thought i'd see the day where pedro neto was the most transferred in player but that's <laughs> that is the world we live in tom some good fixtures there and of course with Raul jimenez injured he's getting um He's, uh, he's definitely getting into good positions for Wolves with Raul Jimenez absent. So it's quite understandable that at 5.8 million, he's a pretty popular pick. Uh, the second on the most transferred in is a slightly better, uh, more youth, normal name to be there. Uh, Mo Salah, you might have heard of him. 12.3 <laughs> million, but uh, people are, of course, trying to get him back in after he deflected a fine goal against Tottenham and he has Crystal Palace away coming up at the weekend. So that'll be just fine. Kind of the other transfers in that are kind of worth talking about there who have just over 50,000 transfers in Son you've heard of him as well Wilfred Zaha Patrick Bamford Harry Kane's almost got 50k transfers in and then Yannick Vestergaard there he is people uh, still getting in those Southampton defenders he's up to 4.9 million now which is bloody hilarious yeah, he's this year Stephen Ward, isn't he? People are logging in going, I've got you know, five million-ish to spend on the defender. Oh, this guy will do. He's got a lot of points and then you go. Um, yeah, Mo Salah, we've got to point out that Nick did the premium hokey-cokey in the end uh, on a bound to say, I'm not enjoying this at all, I promise. Um, he sold Mo Salah, brought in Bruno Fernandes and he's got a bit of a swing there. A little bit of a swing. I feel sorry for him. Um, on the other hand, uh, in transfers out, uh, moving swiftly on from there, um, Jota has been sold uh, still in droves. 177k transfers out, which probably explains why Neto and Zaha uh, are g- gathering a bit of a head of steam, doesn't it? Yeah, it absolutely does. And the artist formerly known as J-Rod as well is there at 7.7 million. He's dropping in price and he's dropping in popularity as well. The likes of Riyad Mahrez and Kevin De Bruyne being sold as well. Timo Werner still being sold a bit in the Jota category of, I can't believe he wasn't sold last week or many weeks ago category. And, and then there's a few defenders being sold, Arsenal defenders amongst them, uh, some slow learners there, Gabriel and Bayer, you know, they're in the top three most sold defenders. Yeah, exactly. Um, Gabriel, I think at one point, I think he was he the first player to rise this year. I've, I've he definitely rose in. No, I don't think he rose in game week one, but definitely rose after game week two. He had a goal yeah. against Fulham on the opening day, and then got going after that. But um, yeah, Arsenal never got going. That's the problem. Yeah, that was it. Well, very unsurprising. A uh, lot of transfers in now, I guess. And now the game has just finished. Uh, shall we do our game week reviews? Um, just quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, dig straight into those. Um, We'll break with our usual protocol of uh, Nick going last, as as in the fact that he is always beating us this year. And I'll just uh, go on ahead. I've got 49 points net, which, to be perfectly honest with you, is just fine. It's a perfectly serviceable mini green arrow. I'm probably going to just get up into the top 600k. Where did it come from? Defenders, basically. Um, Martinez, Kufal, Zufal. 
uh, Chilwell as well. So five, eight and eight between those. Cancelo with a one pointer. Grealish disappointing three, but he could have had a million with the amount of uh, key passes he got in there. De Bruyne, I only vice captained with four points, which seems very good compared to <laughs> my captain, Bruno Fernandes, who I also did the premium hokey hokey to get in. Obviously only getting two points double to four. Stuart Dallas coming off the bench yet again for me. I think that's the third time this season he's come off the bench with a return, a seven-pointer. Nice. Uh, Dominic Calvert-Lewin and then two blanks from Suchek. And Harry Kane will take it. Yeah, definitely will take it. Um, I didn't fare much better with a 50. Um, Emmy Martinez uh, this evening, obviously with the eight-pointer, is actually my highest scoring player this week. Um I guess net uh, De Bruyne with the captaincy with, with the eight. I still feel pretty dirty and still feel a little bit shocked, frankly, that that was the quote unquote winning captain between the Bruno and De Bruyne. This is a season defining which captain you choose. It was being trailed as um, has predictably pieced out into a pile of rubbish. Um, Mo Salah um, obviously got the goal, um, and I know that a lot of people are now angling, angling to bring him back in ahead of Crystal Palace. Uh, but yeah, same as you, chill well. Uh, as well uh, with that assist at the back it wasn't that great actually I didn't get as many uh, returns as you did uh, Carl Walker with one point uh, came off the bench uh, and uh, Mr Diaz uh, scored the own goal uh, which is obviously obviously great and Man City hadn't, hadn't conceded in 10 hours of football before his outspun boot converted that own goal in and up front returns yet again for my premium for my tiddlers front free uh, Calvert-Lewin and Adams both for assists and Paddy B uh, Patrick Bamford with a goal so yeah 50 up to 1.5 million hooray and I think Nick got 45 this week 46 I think maybe uh, for those who are counting I'm pretty sure he's still in top 100k somewhere or other yeah, forty six. Yeah, he's 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 doing just fine. Our Nicholas, he's uh, flying ahead of both of us at the moment. So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm sure he'll survive losing to us by what three or four points this week. <laughs> I know it's a grey arrow, isn't it? Something like that. In, interesting one though. It's kind of this game week. I think the story of it pretty much ties in with the power of uh, doing nothing that we talked about a few weeks ago with Salah flying along nicely and Son as well. Like these were both kind of players that if you were advocates of the the premium hokey cokey with which both myself and Nicholas have been uh, you've probably lost out and like we both did this week it's, it's a funny we it's a funny game and it's very hard to work out what to do with the premiums and sometimes less is more yeah although I've got to give a, a shout out to someone who tweeted me earlier on uh, John Truelove who did the hokey cokey but it's like a different way to you guys and brought in Martial and Rashford this week alongside Bruno tripled up on United unfortunately Captain Bruno but yeah Martial and Rashford are oh, inspired inspired loads of moves that's what uh, 15 20 points for uh, unique points to you so more power to you john well done right let's move on to the q a then this week uh, that wasn't a question it was just a humble brag and an ask for a, an ask for a shout out on the pod uh, but the real questions do come and they start with kevin de bye bye uh, so thomas danes asks if kdb is now the cuttable midfield premium if you're looking to get son and or kane back on your side fpr price he asked the same you know is son better value than kdb over the next few games or so and uh KD and F- FPL dummy Tom, I guess, kind of takes that question one further. Is Son going to be the player to keep up the underlying stats and be worthy of that sort of number? Um, let's take this one by one and talk about KDB first. Um, I'm strongly considering selling this week, uh, but my perception of this is coloured by two things. One, the doubles and blanks announcements, meaning I need more money eventually. And two, outcome bias. Uh, let's talk about money first. I need the money now for the double game week and blank game week plan that I like. Um, so I, but I'm fully conscious of the fact I'm just finding any planning I do for selling with any stats that I'm about to present. I'm just making that explicit, basically. We always say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm building this case objectively. No, no, I'm building it completely subjectively. I know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it just to justify myself. And the outcome bias is helping, obviously. So I kept, I've kept KDB four times this year. I've got two blanks, one quasi-blank, which now looks like a huge success, of course. But those those extra two bonus points, they were just like a, like a sympathy shag, weren't they? And uh, there was a one double digit from him this season. So in my opinion, he, he and City don't look right, despite the stats being great. I'm always a big stat objectivity fan, but to the eye, I think it's just less clear. So I'm considering selling, maybe not this week, maybe we're selling soon. Um, I'm a little bit angry with him, but less angry now, obviously, after Bruno Blank. So uh, I'm, not, I'm just going to try not to act rashly, but uh, I'm considering getting rid of him in, in not very long. Um, there's a good little bit of data on this is that um, Bruno 
prior to the, prior to this evening in uh, just uh, just on 900 minutes uh, had uh, scored 83 points Vardy uh, 920 minutes 87 Salah 95 Son 105 Kane 107 and KDB same number of minutes 60 points uh, so at least 20 points uh, over 20 points below um, all of these other players who are in the quote unquote premium bracket I know there's a bit of outcome bias there but I still think that that is probably something worth bearing in mind when it comes to Kevin De Bruyne relies on his team yes but is he, he he's not a talisman in the same way other FPL assets are like he's not 11.5 million worth of talisman at the moment when you consider Bruno 1 million less price Son 2.5 million less price at the start of the season and comfortably outscoring him what do you think on uh, Kevin De Bruyne is it time for Katie bye bye interesting set of words there that he's not a, a 11.9 value talisman like you see the thing is is that had we had even a single return in the last two games, I'm not sure we would go with that as resolutely. And I don't mean to shoot you down at all. And per- to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not going to get into planning for the double game weeks yet. And so I'm going to make my transfers just based on one or two week uh, horizons at the moment. And I'll start worrying about the double game weeks a little bit further down the line. I just rather prioritize my kind of short term point getting. And the fact of the matter is, is just the way my site is structured. I won't be selling De Bruyne. I have a Riyad Mahrez sized problem to get rid of before I got get rid of him. Now, the thing is, his underlying stats are, they're fine. They're good. They're quite good. They're even, they're better than Sons and they've been better than Sons for quite a bit of this season, but Sons scores almost every single shot on target that he has. So <laughs> that makes the underlying stats a little bit farcical. The thing with City, of course, is that it's also undeniable that they have seriously dropped off and they've had one or two good games. The Burnley game is, of course, a prime example. The Fulham game, uh, De Bruyne could, could easily have had a cricket score, but he didn't. He didn't. And with Southampton and Newcastle up yet, or up next, I can totally understand why it would be Katie bye bye. At the same time, I still think that there's more than enough capacity there to outscore all the rest of the premiums in those next two games. And City could just as well rack up a big score. And we know that it's always there. And with Spurs having Leicester up next, I expect that's going to be a a tight enough game. I'm I'm content to go without Son for yet another week. Uh, Liverpool, Crystal Palace, they're traditionally a tough game for Liverpool. Uh, So again, I'm not rushing to get Salah back in after selling him on the hokey cokey. It's look, look, the the end of the thing is that, yeah, the other premiums have proven to be much, much better value than KDB so far. But at the same time, I don't think that it's quite as simple as discount KDB, City's penalty taker, in a team that will score three or four goals soon at some stage, just hasn't happened too frequently. Sure. I just think that um, I agree with you, the stats are still pretty scary. Um, so he's top for XA over the last six, a comfortably beating out Bruno. Um, I think he's also in the top three or four for shots in the box. Uh, so, I mean, of, of all players, yes, he, he's the one who's kind of underperforming what you'd expect. It's, it's um, more shots in the box than Jamie Vardy in the last six. It you is, know? Like, it is. It's, it's very good. He's he's ahead of Calvert Lewin. He's quite close to uh, Benteke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, close he's, to uh, Benteke, the, indeed. The stat, the stat monster from Belgium himself. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as I said, I'm basically trying to build a case to do something that I'm. If, if I didn't want to remove him to finance stuff for the doubles and blanks, I wouldn't be as strongly building the case. And as I've said, I'm being explicit about the fact that that's my underlying motivation for building this case. Um, but to flip it on its other, on, on the other side and look at Son for a second, he's overperformed actually by 6.6. Um, and I guess, yeah, I mean, he's a clinical top class finisher, isn't he? Um, if there is a finishing skill in F- in real football, like there is in Football Manager, he'd have eighteen or nineteen. Like think sort of Danny Ings with the curl finishes, that sort of ability to be able to convert those chances. It's um, certainly this year, anyway. Well, um, oh, that's an interesting one. So over the last five years, how many years has he overperformed his XG? Overperformed it barely, or overperformed it? Overperformed it. Oh, how many years am I going with? Two or three? Uh, I'd say he's probably, he's probably outperformed it on all of them based on the yeah, framing uh, of that yeah, question. That's it. So according, <laughs> according to uh, Understat over the last five years, he's outperformed that student every single year. And there were three years when he significantly outperformed it. So he outperformed it by more than 2.5. Um, so there's all that, right? Now let's add in the FPL elements of Son. Um, for This is kind of in, in answer to the question about Son and KDB and Son's kind of longevity here. He's, he's a... a 
just below Kane in terms of points scored, isn't he? Or is he just above him now? I think he might be just above him now, actually, because he scored, he scored this week. And he's got 16 ownership and rising. Now, you can't win with him, but you certainly are punished without him, was my experience from this weekend and the weekend before and the weekend before. Um, I, we are going to do probably in January a should we have sold Spurs pod? Um, just because I think that's going to be quite an interesting one. Maybe a masochistic one, but an interesting one to do. And I'm, I kind of got to the point this weekend where I was just like, if I can't beat them, I really need to join them and just reverse the issue and not make a position out of the failed issue. Um, so um, in answer to a couple of these questions then, is KDB the cuttable premium? Hmm. Obviously, with reservations, it's a probably maybe a qualified yes if you want to get Spurs back on your side because the, the ownership is so high. If you are struggling, they are going to probably smash you a little bit, um, especially because their fixtures do get uh, considerably better quite soon. I know it's Le- Leicester and Wolves next too, but after that, things do kind of improve. As uh, I think the 16 and 17 especially is very, very nice. See, and- I think these two fixtures that are coming up for Spurs and I, just the last two games have been quite instructive about Spurs and I think they've maybe hinted at something that could have happened all year which didn't happen, which was just Spurs being caught out for trying to counter-attack or to just efficiently win games. Mm. Uh, Now, in the Crystal Palace game, that resulted obviously in a draw and disappointment. And of course, we still had returns for Son and Kane, as they do. But (laughs) it was one each, okay? And that's, that's just how it works now, it seems. The Liverpool game, on the other hand, and I know people will point to the XG, they'll point to the fact that Spurs had the chances, but that's only because Liverpool have a style that kind of complements their counter-attacking. And so, you know, Liverpool had the confidence to play the game their way and play into Spurs' hand to some extent and get the win, and they did get the win. Leicester and Wolves are kind of the types of games that I think will be tough for Spurs, and with that in mind, I'm just not in as big a rush to get on in now. The Fulham game in game week 16, Fulham's yeah. obviously having a slight upturn in form, but there's no way I'm going without Son and Kane for that game though yeah and then 16, 17 as you said Fulham and Leeds those are the ones I guess people would be targeting definitely um, but you know in, in answer to a couple of these questions then FPL Pricey he asked about the value of KDB versus Son I think without knowing how KDB does against uh, Southampton and Newcastle yeah, I think it's indisputable that 9.5 million of Son is better value than 11.9 million of KDB on paper. Yes, KDB is probably a better footballer, but as an FPL asset, 9.6 million for Son is a massive discount on the premium. And if Son can keep up his underlying data, well, he has overperformed in the past. So, yeah. And then, um, like, look, you'd think he would. Like, you really would think he will. Just, yeah, exactly. You can't, uh, making some sort of forecast that he won't is just too dangerous now. We've yeah, it's Gander's, it's Gander's fallacy. And then Nick, I think Nick, Nick said at the start of the season, this is the season that he gets over 200 points because he's never done it before. And he's you know, over halfway now. I would not be surprised, barring injury, touch what doesn't happen. And I wouldn't be surprised if he does manage to achieve that, especially you know if, if they do keep efficiently winning games like they do. So yeah, there you go. That's my sort of slight treaties on why I might sell KDB sometime soon. And Stag's very, very wise words of probably why you shouldn't. And ignore what I do because I'm terrible at FPL. Right. Next question then. Pre wildcard differential. So we know a lot of people are um, planning to smash out their wildcard in game week 16. There are a lot of patient people out there who have kept it. Uh, Vardy Boys got onto us and asked if there are any under the radar differentials to target for the next few ahead of wildcarding. So I think that'll be just the next two in isolation, I believe. And uh, Len Boy Ayabami also asked a similar question. He said he's willing to sell KDB. Again, we just spoke about that. And he's pursuing some punts. He says Aguero in is one that he he's considering so what sort of players have caught our eye i guess maybe after this evening rashford and martial coming forward is an obvious kind of thing and um, i did look at their stats before for this question and uh, rashford was pretty much nowhere i mean i don't think anybody could look to those online stats and go, yeah rashford is definitely pr- bound to blow up that's absolutely rubbish unless you're john true love of course um he never really got that out of position fanfare that obamian did when he was reclassified did he and martial's obviously been a bit rubbish this year Blank game week, I think, really did uh, halt any sort of you know, optimism about the United players just in game week one, let's say. And that's probably why Rashford didn't get talked about too much. But yeah, the, the, the underlying stats just haven't been so much that you'd be jumping on them. And of course, when there's Bruno in there, you'd probably go for that talismanic figure on penalties ahead of Rashford. Like, that's been his greatest issue. Like, yeah. is he a differential? Yeah. Do they have leads next? Yeah, that's, that's an okay game. But like, I'm, not, I'm not thinking that I'd be rushing to get him in, nevertheless. No, I, th- I think he sits alongside Bruno in a sort of uh, a double up to differentiate sort of thing. 
think it would take a brave manager to go Rashford over Bruno because any return where Bruno bests Rashford, you're you're just going to be crumbling, aren't you? Um, unless you live a charmed life like Mr. Harris does, but yeah, it, it's just it's just one of those anyway. Uh, moving on to other differentials, Anthony. Um, do any other uh, ones come to mind in your travail through the data? I think uh, it is the most transferred in player this week, Pedro Neto, 5.8 million, three goals, one assist in the last five. He's obviously getting good game time now and in getting in a pretty solid position with Raul Jimenez out. His, you know, the underlying stats are fine, perfectly serviceable, great for a 5.8 million uh, option. But like, and uh, of course, yeah, Wolves have some decent fixtures as well coming up those next two, you've Burnley away and the Spurs game, which isn't that great, but kind of in a more kind of longer term horizon, their fixtures aren't too bad. Uh, you could talk about the likes of Luckman and Cavaliero there as well. <laughs> Newcastle away, Southampton home up next as a Spurs game and then a Burnley game. Like They, they actually do have quite good underlying stats. Uh, Cavaliero definitely stand out and obviously has the penalties. Luckman, just he's 5.0, which kind of makes him a pretty handy option to put into your side. That yeah. said, just sorry for Tom before you What's jump up? on it, but I do think that it's just looking at the fixtures and looking at who's in form and where you probably need to be getting your money in these next one to two to three weeks. I feel like it's the the composite differential is what you should be chasing. You know, the the good players that you've got in your team as a group together being your differential, not necessarily the random differential. That said, Luckman, Cavadero, good enablers, <laughs> Neto, likewise. But I don't think that they should be your main uh, transfer objective. Yeah, that is exactly going to be my approach. But um, outside of my approach, which is to basically get the ultimate five midfield, um, I think I will give a few names here. So you have Cavaliero, um, third for XG over the last six. Um, you know, Newcastle and Southampton. I mean, not great, but Newcastle just conceded, against, conceded five against Leeds. So maybe um, they, they were low XG shots, a lot below XG shots, mind. Um, Allaire, the Allaire Copter, um, third for shots in the box over the last six. He's got a London derby versus Chelsea and Bryson in the next two. Are you really going to go there? Really? Probably not. Um, and Click at Leeds as well. Um, so he's third for chance creation in the last six and on penalties two. So similar sort of proposition to Cavaliero, um, one that Matthew Jones picked out in, the, in a group chat that I in um, they've got my nice and Burnley um, next though so not the best but Leeds do create a lot of chances so feasibly um, he could be one worth looking at and uh, another thing to pull out here um, just from looking at the stats now I'm not sure anyone's going to buy these people but Larice is four for points scored over the last six game weeks with 40 <laughs> he's scored more points than Kane over the last uh, over the last six weeks which is absolutely mad and the West Brom defence is the final thing I want to mention as well. Sam Allardyce comes back to the Premier League. Yes, defensive solidity reigns. Cups of wine are consumed in the director's box. Um, so Allardyce, uh, 61% draws and wins versus losses in the Premier League. Never been relegated. And West Brom, funnily enough, are only a moise away from the managerial merry-go-round bingo, it should be said. So they've had Pardew, Allardyce, Hodgson, Pulis, they're just missing Moyes. It's a shame. Uh, same as Crystal Palace, by the way. Um, so, yeah, maybe we'll see Johnson, Darnell Furlong, these sorts of players in the meta. Isn't there an O'Shea there, Anthony, as well? There is, yeah, Darrell O'Shea. Yeah, I thought that might be. Uh, always international as well. <laughs> yeah. Always tends to be yeah, he's the one, one that of his he... three teams. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the truth of it. Yeah, he, he lends his name to my FPL team name, actually, Fifty Shades of O'Shea. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, so uh, probably not an actual relation of yours, nor 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 nor, nor the great John, um, but nonetheless, uh, a player I who may confirm, I can confirm <laughs> no, neither a relation of myself nor John O'Shea. Okay. <laughs> We've not seen each other at the conventions, just kind of nodded over the convention hall. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing there? Right, okay. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of differentials there, I suppose. Um, over the next two, especially, it's going to be an interesting time just to see what the rotation's like. And oh, Christ knows. Um, but yeah, I hope you'll find something out of that. But yeah, no, Amphi did mention getting a, a your group of players aligned, I suppose, to cover as many of the bases or, you know, uh, just... just uh, uh, refine your 11 um, I guess and maybe that could be the best thing to do so fit, focus on plugging gaps in your team rather than kind of going for these shoot for the moon sort of buys um, all right next question defensive planning I think we've had sort of a question like this for the last couple of weeks but Bryn Stewart nonetheless asked this week what are your season plans for your defense oh 
big big ask. Um, but he says it feels like midfield and forward lines pretty much template because um, everyone's got very similar big boys. So is there any hope in the clean sheets? And this is funny because I noted, um, I think at the start of this game week in in kind of our little mini league, Anthony, that um, Nick and James Carroll, who were vying for the top, they had basically everything similar in the front line, but it was all in the defence who was winning or losing this week. So it does seem that there's a lot of this sort of thing going on where the defence seems to be a source of real differentiation at the moment. So, you know, as tired as, as tiredness mounts, do you think we'll see more clean sheets or less? But you see, okay, basically, it's interesting that Bryn has asked this question and said that the midfield and forward line is pretty much template. I'd have almost wondered, was the defence already template? I feel that, okay, you've, you've taken the James and Nick contrast there to suggest that there were kind of differences in defence, but I think that there's an awful lot of the same defenders too. There's quite a lot of one Man City, one Chelsea, one Villa, and then maybe you have your variation in the zone of like the next two players in there. There's usually a Leeds guy in there as well, let's be honest, uh, Stuart Dallas or whatever. So I kind of feel like there is a, a settled core there that a lot of teams tend to have. Oh, is it the highest owned Man City player is four point one percent owned. Ruben Pierre. It's, it's funny the way that like the, the oh, Man- it's Carl Walker Lumpson actually forget that. Yeah, um, but it's it is kind of funny the way like the City defenders aren't actually that highly owned in the overall no, world, and yet you look at kind of Twitter and they're there knocking away in pretty much all the teams that I seem to pay any attention to. <laughs> yeah, so, funny mm-hmm. the way things go, and that makes sense because City, in terms of underlying stats, are the best defense there. In last six, let's say, they're the lowest for big chances conceded, shots in the box, good on the XGC as well. Chelsea defence likewise. And so it's quite logical to have one, if not two, or even three from uh, the Chelsea defence. And uh, yeah, I think that the Leeds defence, like, I just think it's Stuart Dallas who is like some sort of like midfield forward defender hybrid is the one to have in your side and just kind of keep it simple with them. So my season plans for my defence, Bryn, really there can't be season plans. It'll develop, I think, as a form, a new form defence comes through. I've already got my my Sam Allardyce uh, insurance package in Sam Johnston uh, in my team. So with that in mind, I don't see where I'm going to be going next defence-wise. Uh, as I said to the last question, I think I'm going to be kind of prioritising getting my premiums right and that's where my transfers are going to go. I do have Sufa at the moment and I might get out of that West Ham defence. That's one thing I may do. Burnley, I still don't have. Tempting. I know you're going to say the double game week, Tom. I'm not thinking about it. The Bur- <laughs> really, I'm not getting, thinking about it yet. Burnley's there, obviously. Charlie Taylor, 4.4. Two CSs or team clean sheets in the last two. Wolves home, leads way up next. Then Sheffield United and Fulham. So good fixtures coming there for Burnley. Yeah, I'll probably be uh, looking at Charlie Taylor this week, 4.4. I mean, that's, that's a bargain, really, isn't it, for a route into that defence? I mean, as you said, those four fixtures, Wolves, Sheffield United and Fulham, those are going to be diced, aren't they? Those those are clean sheets. We'll be hoping to mug a 1-0 from a Chris Wood shin, something like that from a corner. But, you know, Tarkovsky and me, their return has really made a huge difference to that Burnley team. And Nick Pope is back in form, as you saw with all the saves uh, this evening, or maybe you didn't. You did save yourself a bit of uh, 90 minutes of boredom. Um, the other ones maybe mentioned is Palace, um, 15 to 17. So they've got Liverpool next. Um, they've got Villa, Leicester, Leicester and Sheffield United. They are playing a bit more of an attacking game at the moment, but I wonder whether with tiredness creeping in, uh, they could revert to a more compact sort of way of things, especially for Villa and Le- Leicester. Um, Scott Dan there is 4.4 for example and Okoye Wato is a defender so it is kind of slim pickings but yeah I, I mean I, I'm broadly aligned with what you said there Anthony I think that it's um, and the things that does evolve it's hard to say you've got a season plan with defence I mean back in the day you used to say treat your defence as a unit etc etc like, don't make defensive transfers really unless you have, absolutely have to um, but I think the recent things have definitely challenged that in terms of the attacking fullbacks and how that's worked I mean the Chelsea players that you mentioned obviously in, in many people's teams I can see for example Chilwell so Reese James being done um, by a few down the line to find 0.7 0.6 million worth of value and obviously there's Robertson as well so Liverpool do have a double game week in uh, that uh, in game week 19 um, so I expect there to be some movement around with him especially because he looks like the, the main double up that you do with Salah I can't really see anybody else apart from you know Jota's out for a while don't want Firmino probably don't want Mane in his current form 
that one uh, you probably... Trent is yeah Trent uh, is the only one that the, the, the argument yeah, but... is going to rear its head over the next few games <laughs> yeah. when he's when he's got the game time in I guess he's obviously just coming back at the moment but yeah Liverpool with that double game week United at home and Burnley at home are you know as things go quite decent fixtures and I think definitely now our, our friend our old Nicholas has him already but I do think that Liverpool defenders or i.e. Robertson who can kind of get you those attacking returns and defensive returns is a bit of a differential let's say in the FPL community not in actual terms he's 18.1 percent are owned but in FPL let's say community terms I think there's a bit of headway to be made there with him for sure and he is he is the route to the double up for now I mean he's on all the corners now both sides uh, and if you watch the if you watch them play like Trent has basically become a tucking in Ben Davis style fullback or fullback defensive duties rather and Robertson's allowed to do what he wants it's really interesting to see how he's kind of Trent's games completely kind of moved backwards in terms of what he now does and defense solidity seems to be what he's all about Robertson is given license to do what he wants um really it's, against mad. it's, it's kind of mad isn't it yeah, yeah. It's, it's been kind of hard to work out whether that's kind of a an Alexander Arnold maintenance policy or if this is kind of more of a long-term thing yeah, no, it is, it is very weird because obviously you obviously see like Joe Gomez fielded in situations where they wanted to kind of play more defensively, and I wonder whether Klopp's kind of tasked Trent with being more defensive this year rather than going for the assist. But you know, a lot of us went went for him in game week one and had him for a little while. I think I had him up till game week eight, game week nine, something like that. And and it's it's been really fascinating to see the turnaround. I know, I know if a, a few cool kids have gone, oh yeah, I'm getting Trent straight back in, and they have been quite happy about that. But you know, watching the games, you've got to just be looking at Robertson and thinking, yeah, well he's the one. And I think as I said that him being the only viable double up really um with with Salah maybe the one there in terms of the defense um but yeah no broadly interesting kind of area uh, the only other one to mention by the way is James Justin um, at Leicester so each week I do actively root for a clean sheet wipeout because he's owned by almost a quarter of the game still as he was 4.5 at the beginning obviously people like us were saying oh that's fantastic value and he has been fantastic value uh, but with Anthony's man Ricky P Ricardo Pereira coming back he may not be uh, an active uh, member of defence much, long, much longer but yeah I still root for them having Fiji wipe out it did yeah but with Ricardo Pereira it's kind of one of those things I think we've been saying he's coming back for <laughs> like Nathan Ferguson yeah, yeah like thir- there's 13 game weeks of that now really at this stage so I think initially we thought it was going to be October and I know he didn't he get a little bit of game time or he's certainly been back in training with the first he team was in he the UEFA league, yeah. league yeah mm-hmm. hasn't played a Premier League game so far this season and the, the day will come but James Justin has definitely uh, done very well so far top scoring it's def- Leicester defender and definitely popular for a reason yes indeed yeah. indeed Right, well, that's probably enough on the defence, unless you want to go into Vestigar, but no, no, let's not, let's not talk about him. Um, Southampton defence, though, well, oh, highly earned. Right, okay, and the, the next thing, oh, we're still staying at the back, um, goalkeeper transfers. So, Ant Dickinson, he's planning ahead of the blank of double game weeks. We'll talk about that, as I said, much more next week. And he asks, is there any merit in goalkeeper transfers, especially if you're planning a bench boost eventually? Um, for free? Yeah, sure, why not? Um, you know, Johnston and Martinez rotate well, Um I guess, um, if you're doing a bench boost and you want to keep Martinez for whatever reason. I don't ever rate a goalkeeper transfer for a hit, though, any point. Um, lowest ceiling, and if it's non-playing keeper, but if it's low non-playing keeper, you might as well make the move or try to for free ahead of the, the bench boost, something like that. Um, I'm planning to leave Martinez, I think, as it stands, just have him as a single and just leave him there, basically. I mean, keepers are very unsexy, aren't they? But you did make a goalkeeper transfer, didn't you, the other week? Um, did, you re- yep. did you remove Martinez? No, I kept Martinez. Um, okay. I sought Beta Keep Peacock Farrell uh, to get in uh, Sam Johnston. So I have those two goalkeepers now. I just, I've never liked going with just one goalkeeper and I, I just had to fix it. And when the Martinez blank came up, I took the chance. I did take a hit. You can you can say that Johnston was the hit or you could say that the other transfer was the hit. I, I don't mind, guys. Yeah, because Johnston but, got zero. Yeah, yeah. So we can just point to Mara as being the hit instead because his four pointer was so much better. But at the same time, uh, yeah, look, for Ant's question, I think you need to prioritize probably outfield players. Like, are you going to get to 15 for this bench boost? Like, the goalkeeper transfer probably shouldn't be your main objective here, your main priority here. I feel like they're, if you have that spare transfer to use, there are probably, there's probably like a succession of transfers that you can go through to maximize your points in the weeks coming up to the double game week, which will probably yield more FPL points. Then just having two goalkeepers on your bench boost 
in a double game week. That's my punch. You're you're putting an awful lot of hope on things going right across two games in a double game week when you might be able to just, you know, have the right premiums for th- two different weeks in the next five, yeah. which feels a lot better to me. Yeah, I mean, we'll get to this again next week, but if you've got a goalkeeper who over two over two weeks, if it's a single single game week goalkeeper, right? They're probably going to have a game uh, in the blank, is how it looks at the moment. You don't, there's no teams who have a blank and then a, a single. Um, so you get two games. Just depends in the, what week you get the two games, effectively. So you don't really win too much, and because they're goalkeepers, I mean, you're hoping for a pen save to get a real explosion, aren't you? So and I like, be... if you just look at look at the double game week fixtures as well, like Fabianski's too expensive for you to go for. You've got better cheaper options there in that West Ham defense if you want to the likes of my friend Sufal who is still on the cutting block just in the long term sense for that question and uh, like really otherwise you're looking at Ilan Melier really the Leeds yeah, are decent fixtures there for Brighton and Southampton but <laughs> They're, they're, not really? keeping any, they're not keeping any clean sheets are they at all I mean they're, they're, yeah, it's like, they're not like, into second Dallas might score right. yeah yeah. I don't, I'm not sure, don't think Melier will um, and Johnston as well has got the, the Sam Aldice factor. So, I mean, that, that could be, again, quite a decent one. But I mean, I'm quite happy with just leaving Martinez in there. I mean, back-to-back, back-to-back, BAP uh, performances has been quite useful. Um, so I'll definitely take that. And the final question this week, so quite short and sweet, um, is FPL Elf, um, who's a Southerner, I found out this week. He's a Leeds fan, but he's a Southerner. And you know, sometimes when you, when you speak to someone on the internet for quite a while, and you don't really know them very well but you take little hints about them big Leeds fan you know had a, has an avatar of an elf so i just assume i heard the sort of northern brogue coming for everything that he wrote funny he was a southerner from kent and i just get the kind of chavvy accent in my ear um whenever i read his voice now but anyway and um, he asks sorry uh, Tom, do you think yeah. that the north of england is in the arctic circle that the elf well, thing was an indication that he was I from did. the north of england I did. Like, I did. It's, it's not in finland i know but i just assume you know it's dark people no, people people live in a different way I, I don't know i don't get it um, i'm kidding of course i love the north um but um just to move to the intended joke about a elf's actual accent um because my girlfriend's from kent as well so this is how people like that sound all right mate so you deal how to deal with a horrible game week uh, without doing something rash when it's just a couple of weeks to digest it i'm guessing do violence and beer any other suggestions is what he asked us this week um so i mean it has been a difficult week for him, I'm going to say. Um, I did extend him a virtual hug. I think he had about, he was about 7 million a game week rank or something like that. It was a genuine stinker. I, I do genuinely feel horrible for him. Um, but I guess, you know, you were, we're at, if you're at the point now, game week uh, 13 in the season, it, we're at the point where not many people are new to FPL. You, you'll all have had bad game weeks before. And I guess you just have sufficient learned experience in how to deal with a bad game week. Um my advice succinctly is this one absorb it's going to hurt a bit i've had a lot of these so i've got a system down right i tend to be quite numb to actually um but i try to resist the urge to be on twitter or masochistically making rash changes to my team so absorb you know just take it it's happened you know you've got to deal with it quickly two laugh um after all you get to the point when you remember you made a perfectly plausible decision or decisions and it's just not worth for you call it luck call it variance call it pet being a dick but just laugh and finally move on as time moves away from last week and towards a new one you'll start to look forward and move on and think what can i get next week and bury all the bad memories of the week just gone <laughs> it's somewhere in your head never to be uh, thought of again so yeah absorb laugh and move uh, anthony how do you deal with bad game weeks um usually i just tend to mull over it and just disappear from at least tweeting too much but I'm still there responding away quietly just mulling over the thing but I think my strategy from is to definitely avoid rash transfers and what I tend to do instead is make a late transfer so you know I basically just allow my gut to take me at the very end I you know absorb the stats as I do whilst doing this pod or whilst sitting on Twitter mulling and just reading the odd article and the subreddit and things and then I just let my gut take me and you've actually got a really good opportunity out with a traditional Saturday deadline of course being 11 a.m. in all parts of England north and south <laughs> so I think there's, there's a, that's it's a good opportunity to do that uh, late change on a Saturday morning and just really kind of feel your way through this and get out the other side and I, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, just make sure you turn the dial up on about 10.30 so you've got time to be on the internet in time for 11 o'clock. 
but yeah, no, I think it's definitely one of those that yeah, we've all had horror, horror, horror game weeks. And I, I often feel actually a little bit jealous of people who don't podcast if you've had a horrible game week because the amount of times they that I've had to come on here and put a brave face on it. Or, you know, that meme of a, of a angry face behind a kind of a smiling mask face while Nick goes, well, you know, I got 75 points this week. And um, yeah, you know, I was a bit disappointed actually because uh, this guy got four. And I'm just like, shut the Jesus Christ, I've got 50. Not something. Like, yeah, I was like, well done, mate. Well done. Yeah, it, 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 Carl Walker's Peter saved my game week. I need 18 points. Go away. <laughs> yeah. I got nine points off the bench, and that was good. Was, oh, my God. Poor Captain, Zaldan. the best player in my team, of course, as well. Nice 25 pointer or 25. Yeah, if you got 25 from doubling a captain score, that'd be pretty good. Yeah, all, all coming up Harris this year, isn't it? As it seems to every year. I don't really know what it is. But anyway, um, hopefully that was uh, vaguely useful. Hopefully you're now in the last stage um, uh, rather than in the absorbing stage. And hopefully you haven't made a dire transfer. I apologize for your Ken accent. I'm sure you've got a nice one. Right, let's move on to the end of the pod then. And it's transfers and captains. And Anthony, I'm aware that you haven't really thought about it. Have you thought about it during the course of this pod? I've thought about it somewhat, Tom. And I think I'll sell Riyad Mahrez. I'm tripled up on City at the moment between Cancelo, De Bruyne and Mahrez. And I think he is going to be the one that moves for someone. I have a little bit of budget there, so I could do something interesting i'm i'm just not quite certain what i'm i won't uh gild the lily and make up that i have some great plan i, I really really don't uh, as for my captain it's probably going to be fernandez i haven't quite got over the fact the novelty of having him in my side even after getting um, a nice disappointment for having him in my side for the first time this season i'll I think i'll go forward with that again although kane is in my head yeah no, that makes sense i am um, i'm going to have to adopt the if you can't beat them join them uh with son i think i don't think i can quite get to kane as easily i can get to son and the beauty of his prices that you can get there uh, it's just how i do it so before i sat down to do my notes i was thinking yeah i'm selling kevin de bruyne um but kind of thinking about it more today messing around with my team i found a way that i can get son um alongside Grealish, de bruyne fernandez and salah all in one team it does mean a, i've got to buy brewster this week it does mean a bench of Lewis, Kilman, and Brewster uh, for Chris for, for, for Friday, for Saturday, and for Boxing Day. So that's a bit worrying. However, um, I can get a very good team to start with and then build from there. And it might be the last chance I can do something like this and have all five of those players in one team in one midfield. So I'm a little bit tempted to do it. I was really close to doing it actually on my wild card i don't post my thoughts up anymore on twitter i used to back in the day like write every single thought i had and i post it oh, here's my plan is my plan now my plan now my plan now i, I can't stop doing that and um, but there was a 352 that i really liked them which i didn't go with at the end i went for the, you know, the 343 that i did go with and now i see it staring at me in the face i think oh you know i, I can't pass this up a second time can i so i'm very tempted to do it we will see we will see um but i am kind of now i've calmed down a little bit about De Bruyne with southampton and newcastle coming up next i am slightly less hot on selling him than i was uh, the other day and certainly less hot on selling him now than i was this morning after the four pointer beat the two pointer so there you go uh anyway i think that's probably all we've got time for in this little quick fire so i've got a bit of to get up yeah, it was a pretty rapid pod, but hopefully that will have assisted you folks. We were who got the assist. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you have not already. Correspondence section, who got the assist at gmail.com with all of your thoughts, addendums, opinions, theories, voice messages, songs, poetry, Christmas carols. We'll, we'll take it all, guys. And uh, we'll be back on Monday night with FPL General to discuss Christmas and those blanks and doubles. Yeah, really looking forward to having Mark FRL General on the pod as we seem to every year now as a Christmas tradition. So yeah, that would be a nice Christmas present for you, our listeners. Um, I hope to see you in this quick turnaround period. Looking forward to return to a full fat pod format in short order. Speak to you in just a few days. Good luck in the game week this weekend. Goodbye. So long. So long. All right. Very good. Cool. Very good. Very good. I'll let, I'll let you go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, I think it's an up at 5.30 type job for me again and finish this essay. <laughs> Excellent. Good luck. Cheers. Oh, it's a goal. Who got the assist? Who got the assist?